Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I guess we are ready to start. So, <laughs> I said that already. Welcome. I hope you enjoy the conference. I hope you enjoy Sofia and Bulgaria. Uh, first of all, I'll want to say big thanks to our sponsors. Without them, the event would not be possible. Of course, the FreeBSD Foundation, our biggest sponsors, they've been supporting us every year, and here they are again. <laughs> Ag Systems, also a long-term sponsor, big thanks to them as well. And we're lucky to get Trivago on board for the first year this time. And we hope they join us next year again. <laughs> Google, of course, with us every year. And Google are actually giving away an Acer Chromebook. Um, there will be a raffle. Uh, uh, anyone who wants to join in uh, should open the link, fill in a quiz, and maybe they'll win an Acer Chromebook. Uh, the link is also in the programs. Um, are again with us uh, for the last couple of years. Madison Gurka. As the Narrow Networks. PC Engines, again with us. Um, Eurogame Technology, it's a Bulgarian company, my employer actually. <laughs> the NetBSD Foundation. <laughs> so a couple of quick announcements before we start with the keynote. Uh, the social event will be tonight at Sofia Hotel Balkan and will start at 7.30 p.m. Uh, oh, so we had uh, to make a few couple, a few last minute program changes. There will be no uh, FreeBSD Dev Summit reports, but we have three new talks on the schedule this afternoon, and those are the talks. They will be um, on the website in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and of course, we are live streaming the event, and those are the links to the web streams. Okay, so enjoy the conference, and I now give you Jordan Hubbard, who will give the first keynote. Hi, uh, I'm Jordan Hubbard. I'm currently the CTO of IX Systems, one of the sponsors of this conference. And uh, obviously, FreeBSD and I go back a long ways. In fact, I probably should have called this talk looking forward to another 20 years to be symmetrical, but I can't see more than 10 years ahead, and in 20 years I plan to be dead. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the future. And the title of my talk is a little bit of a double entendre. Right? I am looking forward to another 10 years. I think uh, there's some great things ahead of us, but I'm also going to try to make some uh, suggestions and, and, and uh, points about what we need to do to be relevant in 10 more years. So I'm going to predict I can't win this either way, because if you disagree with me, you will say that things don't work this way in the open source community. It's a big hobby, and we do what we want. And if you agree with me, you'll say things don't work this way in the open source community, and we do whatever the heck we want. But I hope to change your mind a little bit about that, because I think for many of us here, uh, especially myself, uh, but certainly not limited to myself, this is not a hobby anymore. This has become um, more than that. And we have, we have achieved more than, than what you would achieve with a mere hobby. And I think we're, we're certainly uh, all in personal positions where FreeBSD is a lot more relevant to our daily lives. So. But let me first look at, let us first look at where we came from. So, FreeBSD 1.0, November 1st or November 2nd, depending on what time zone you're in, 1993, uh, just over 20 years ago, uh, I did the first 
uh, as the release engineer, but obviously we're working with many people, uh, 1.0 release of FreeBSD. And this was our, this is our 20th anniversary. So uh, we're almost 21 years old now. And as I said, we can, we can drink legally in the US in just a couple more months. <laughs> yes, we'll, uh, we'll touch more on the drinking theme in a little bit. So this was our first distribution media. Um, okay, I'm lying just a little bit, um, but not by much. This was our first distribution media. I remember installing FreeBSD a number of times uh, over a 1.2 megabyte floppy. And uh, that's, of course, when I couldn't do it over a parallel port because that was faster. Uh, that was really high tech. Um, and this had ramifications, which, which we'll, we'll kind of touch on ramifications throughout this talk. Um, you'll notice, for example, that all of the files in the bin disk, and this was true until comparatively recently, is about just over 230K. And that's because that was the size that we could break up the media and fit into both a 1.44 megabyte floppy and a 1.2 megabyte floppy. So in case you've ever wondered why we picked that specific size, it divided evenly into the installation media of the day. And uh, BSD, as it turns out, is full of these little uh, Easter eggs where you wonder, why did they do it like that? Well, let me take you 20, 25 years back, as Kirk can certainly tell us many stories about. This was the 1.0 ports collection, back when it was manageable. <clears throat> um, you can see Bash is there, so. Is it vulnerable? <laughs> it might have been. We don't know. Can we scooch the uh, projector over a little bit? I think we're clipping, uh, clipping off the left edge. I don't know if that's possible. But um, in any case, Obviously, some humble beginnings. And this was my first build machine. That actually is not an actual picture of my first build machine. I don't think I ever photographed it, but it's pretty much what it looked like. And it had a absolutely blistering 50 megahertz Intel DX2 processor in it. Uh, and I, I paid, uh, no kidding, uh, $1,600 for the first one gigabyte hard drive. I remember when they first came out and I went and paid cash for it so that I could do builds of FreeBSD. Um, this was the first dream laptop many of us had. Uh, this is Warner Losh and I in Japan. That's me touching of Sony Vio, uh, very lustfully because I couldn't actually afford one at the time. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was obviously a little lighter back then. We'll touch on that too. Um, so, um, and this was our very first conference. Um, as you can see, not much has changed. <laughs> that is Kirk hoisting a, uh, a pitcher of beer. That is David O'Brien in the background bringing two more pitchers of beer um, to, the, to the podium at the Radisson. Uh, I think this was you giving your BSD talk. Uh, where you, yeah, and you got progressively more inebriated as the talk went on, but you remained remarkably lucid. I think we actually understood you for pretty much 99% of that talk. Um, but this was at the Radisson Hotel in Berkeley, and uh, uh, it was uh, it, it's really interesting to think about how humble our beginnings were. I mean, the first morning, the, uh, the water line to the hotel was cut, so nobody could take a shower, and everybody showed up with their hair all plastered to their heads and looking and smelling not great. And, uh, but we had a great time, and we managed to pull it off, and here we are. Uh, more than 20 years later, still having these conferences and having them internationally. So I think that's really awesome. So the other thing that has certainly changed is that 20 years ago, our targets in the commercial space, and we, we did want to be relevant and have, have commercial users, were ISPs. Pretty much that was at least 90% of, of uh, FreeBSD's user base. Uh, we also did a lot of uh, s small and home office web servers and routers. People got a 386 out of the closet with a couple of ethernet ports and made a router out of it. Um, very do-it-yourself. Uh, I remember from all the uh, traffic on questions. And if we had any, any major companies uh, at all, uh, that was Yahoo, which remains to this day a, a free BST shop, and Hotmail, which does not. Um, we also obviously were, were 
used on a lot of basic developer desktop machines, you know, X11 plus 50 terminal windows uh, was considered an acceptable developer desktop. Again, not much has changed. Um, and the, the majority of FreeBSD machines were physical PCs that ran on AC power. And that may seem like a, a pretty obvious statement to make, but again, this is something that, that we'll come back to later because uh, the things have changed. And the key takeaway from this slide uh, is that FreeBSD's role in the world was pretty overt. The, the brand meant something when you talked about FreeBSD, at least in the network <laughs> services community and whatnot, it had a, had a certain um, cachet and there was, a, there was a, a, a certain brand value around it and everyone was very upfront about using FreeBSD. So here we are 20 years later, that's a 64 gigabyte USB thumb drive, 64 times larger than the hard drive I spent $1,600 for and now most of you have one dangling from your keychains and I uh, probably got it free at some conference as a giveaway. Um, it just amazes me, and, and you know, what you can obviously put on one is, is just astounding. We don't actually put much more than cat pictures and, and small installation images on them, but we could do a lot more with these. And this little $35 device, I rounded up to 50 because you want an SD card, obviously, uh, has more power by probably almost an order of magnitude than my first 486DX2. Uh, so, that is a game changer. And it also means that an entirely different um, part of the world can, can do this now, right? This is something you can sell into, into much poorer countries. Uh, I, I paid a lot of money for my first PC. Again, many orders of magnitude more than $35. And the fact that you can now do meaningful development on something like that is, is again, it's a, it's a game changer. And obviously my dream laptop has evolved somewhat as well. I don't have to stroke it anymore, I do own one. And again, this machine has far more power, almost a terabyte of flash storage, huge uh, display density, very powerful multi-core processor is just, you know, I can, I can run f five or six instances of FreeBSD under virtualization faster than I could ever have run it on a physical machine before. The poor Sony Vio just fell by the wayside somewhere. And the other thing I want to point out, which I think is pretty relevant, is that this has BSD included. You may not consider OS X to be BSD in the, in the most classic sense of the word, but there's a lot of BSD in there, and more importantly, there's Unix in there. And when we bought our Sony Vios way back when, when we could finally afford them, you basically got Windows on it, and, or OS II, if it was that long ago. And that, those were your only choices. And you had to, to rip off some other operating system to get a Unix desktop. So the fact that we actually have a Unix desktop this many decades after Microsoft did their very, very best to kill Unix dead, I think says a lot about the, the staying power of Unix. So obviously the current release version is 10.0, working on 10.1 as I believe we speak. There are now 24,000 ports um, somebody asked me if I had known then what I know now, if I would have done it. Uh, there are hundreds of committers from both, I'm not gonna answer that question. There are hundreds of committers uh, and a lot more, we still have a, lot, a strong showing in academia, but as I mentioned earlier, a lot more of us are in the commercial world. A, lo a lot of us have actually been paid to come here. And that's a, a very interesting and very uh, telling development that again, we've grown up. Um, we also, for the first time, uh, have long-term sources of funding. The FreeBSD Foundation I think, broke a million in donations last year. Um, that's, that's, that's real money now. And it's not, they're not just standing by themselves. There, are, there were a lot of sponsors we saw on that slide a minute ago, and a lot of people putting, putting real sums of money into FreeBSD and sponsoring the development of it, which I think is a really great thing because there are there's always gonna be a category of really annoying things that nobody really wants to do that much for free uh, or just in their spare time. And so the, the funding makes tackling those sorts of challenges possible. But what's also interesting is that the markets have really changed. You know, we're, we're not aiming at where we were 20 years ago or at least we should not be. And one of the things that's really changed is that um, 
the GPL has gone to version three and it has created a, a renaissance in interest uh, in the BSD license in the commercial space. Um, I use that particular animation because I really, you know, you think of kangaroos as nice cuddly animals and then one kicks you into the water, uh, which is how a lot of people felt when in the commercial world when they followed the GPL uh, bandwagon and then suddenly V3 came out and a, a bunch of technologies that they were reliant on went V3 and there was a whole bunch of new scary languages, uh, scary language in there that most lawyers, uh, it scares the crap out of most lawyers. I mean, I've been in a, a lot of meetings with a lot of lawyers where they're going line by line through this thing and going, ah, take it out. So that's actually helped us quite a bit um, in, in, in roles that I'll, I'll touch more on in a minute. So one of the areas in which it's helped us is that you're seeing FreeBSD and other variants of BSD or, or pieces of BSD technology being used in a lot of appliances. Routers, load balancers, uh, security appliances, monitors, uh, file servers, obviously. Um, and it's also the basis for a lot of software appliances which you can put on more generic hardware. Obviously, I work on FreeNAS, so I had to put it on there, but it's by no means the only one. And if you look at the commercial page at the FreeBSD website, you'll see a bunch of different things there. Uh, and as I was surprised to see last year, it's even the base OS for a popular gaming console. So uh, what's really becoming more evident than anything else though is that what we used to consider the embedded market was you know, engine computers and cars and, and uh, avionics computers, things that were really, really small and special purpose, had very limited capabilities, not much memory and some sort of RTOS that ran on them, but that is really changing overnight. And if there's a key takeaway to kind of set against my previous takeaway, it's that FreeBSD is now becoming much more covert in its usage. People rebrand it, right? Juniper calls it Junos. Uh, the uh, uh, company whose name I can't remember right now up in Seattle calls it uh, 1FS. Um, uh, EMC and, and their subsidiary. Uh, th again, if you look at the website, there are probably a dozen different names for FreeBSD now. Uh, people just, I, I don't even know what Sony calls their operating system. They probably don't even refer to it. It's just the operating system that runs in the PlayStation 4. What's that? Orbit. Orbit. Okay, well, there you go. Interesting name. Um, but it's not called FreeBSD. And, you know, is, is that a bad thing? Not really. What, what it is is it just says that FreeBSD has reached a certain commodity value that it's useful as a brand name to know what technology, what, where the technology source is, but you don't have to call your product FreeBSD. In fact, you probably don't want to because it, you're going you're gonna to do different branding exercise around whatever your product is. If you're a security appliance, you're going to try and put the word security in there somewhere. If you're a gaming company, I guess space or, you know. Uh, and so, again, that's, that's a very interesting development for me at least because it, it really does mean we've reached the, the, com the OS commoditization era where FreeBSD as a brand is both meaningful and not meaningful. And in fact, I've had a lot of arguments with people where they've said, well, you really need to change the name of it because FreeBSD, what is that? Well, free has weird connotations. And BSD, well, that was 25 years ago at some obscure uh, place in California. And my rebuttal is always, it doesn't matter. It's just a, just a brand, right? When, when, when we came up with the iPad at Apple, there were a lot of people talking about the connotations of that word. Nobody thinks about it anymore. It is just a brand. And FreeBSD has reached the same place. We don't need to change the name. It's, it's, not, it's not a problem. So, looking at trends, and I just grabbed this slide from, from Gartner, and I don't really care for it very much because it kind of tries to put all of this somehow at the iPad's doorstep, and I don't think that's perfectly accurate. Obviously, mobile devices in general are what have caused that curve to happen. It isn't just Apple releasing the iPad on April 3rd. It was probably the, the match, or the, the, the match that lit the, the gunpowder, but we're really seeing mobile devices take over the world. And uh, that's not going to stop. And in fact, if we look at OS deployments today by sheer numbers, or sorry, Unix OS deployments, phones are obviously the biggest, tablets, watches. That's an artist's conception, by the way. I have no idea what the actual iWatch looks like. 
and cables. What? Unix runs in a cable? Yes, as a matter of fact, it does. There are a number of peripherals out there that do uh, video transcoding, DRM, I hate to say, uh, various tasks that require a pretty robust software stack. You don't want to really take an MPEG-4 decoder stack, which is half a million lines of code, and put it on top of an RTOS, because it turns out that that code was written on some sort of Unix operating system, and it makes all kinds of system calls and relies on a number of libraries. So as you start kind of pulling on that piece of string, you very quickly find out, geez, I, I need a Unix in here. Well, it turns out that's not a big deal because there's enough space in those little connectors to put a tiny little ARM chip at each end. And so one of the first things that Cable does is boot. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what could go wrong, you know? I mean, are, are Cable's going to have heart bleed bugs or, you know? It's, it's, an, it, <laughs> it's an interesting question. So, um, so yes. As I said, the embedded market is really morphing. What you think of as embedded is so embedded you don't probably even realize it. And when we get fully into the Internet of Things, whatever the hell that means, you're going to see even more tiny devices that are in these various ubiquitous roles that you never imagined uh, a Unix operating system being in. But people are going to reach for Unix and stick it in there because it's the easiest and cheapest thing to do. And the, the, the hardware is powerful enough. All the reasons that, that you know, restricted you from doing it, like having only 4K of memory or a one MIP processor, that is so yesterday. So, you know, talking a lot about mobile here, but obviously the enterprise space is kind of the other end of the barbell, and I think it, it deserves its own, own chapter, so to speak. Um, and even there, it's kind of interesting. You're, you're seeing a, a lot of pressure at what we kind of consider the classic enterprise desktop space with people bringing their own devices in. That's, that's the BYOD movement people talk about. And it drives IT administrators insane because they have to take this huge uh, of, array of devices that people insist, and usually people by people I mean the CEO, um, insist on bringing to work and insist on in, uh, operating, interoperating with their software and working with Salesforce and all the various things. And so the, for about three or four years, they fought tooth and nail against it, and finally they just gave up. And so you're seeing that what, what is considered sort of the classic desktop deployment even in the enterprise. And I remember an era when people like GM and Unilever had 10,000, 20,000 desktops. They're, they're going the way of the dodo bird. Um, why, right? Just take your iPad with you or, or your, your tablet of whatever flavor you like or your phablet, your large phone, and uh, use it during the meeting. And that's what people are doing. And they can project from it and do a lot of other things. Uh, the other thing that's squeezing it from the other end is this whole cloud computing thing is becoming a little less nebulous and a bit more specific in that if you want to do uh, computation and you want to do storage and you want to do a certain known set of things, the, the economics of, of off-hosting to the cloud, and I hate that word because it means so, so little and so much, um, is actually becoming pretty compelling. And plus, you're seeing a lot of software vendors, a lot of ISVs saying, I won't sell you a copy of my software any other way. I, I don't want you hosting this yourself. We're hosting it in the cloud. So you, you sign up and you pay your, your monthly fee and uh, pretty soon, why, why do you need anything more than a web browser to run the software? The other thing that's kind of interesting too, and I've been noticing this, uh, I had an older friend of mine, even older than me, uh, say that he just got a job at one of those San Francisco startups uh, that are, are kind of going under the, the collective uh, description of two guys with two laptops in a coffee shop. And he was amazed that they were able to do an entire office's worth of work from their laptops in the coffee shop because every time they committed a change to the code, it fired off this huge chef-driven set of automation which would spin up machine, virtual machines in Amazon EC2 uh, and it, start various tools running and they would do regression tests and a whole bunch of things and some more VMs would fire up and it would go to a staging server and then they would connect to their little uh, URL for the staging server and they'd look at it and say, you know, click around, use it, yep, looks pretty good. They'd click a ship it button and then boom, it would go and deploy. 
And during the peak of the automation, and they would run a lot of tests. I mean, this wasn't just a fly by the seat of your pants kind of operation. They probably had 50 or 60 VMs running. And so they didn't need a, a data center. They didn't need an, a dedicated IT guy. They just, they just had somebody who understood Chef or SaltStack or one of those automation frameworks and uh, spend a few days or maybe a few weeks or a few months even spinning up all of the automation infrastructure they needed and then they were done and they just used that. So again, this has ramifications which I'll get back to. So no, one's, no one uh, argues that Unix is basically Lego, right? It's, it's a bunch of composable pieces you can put together in interesting ways and, and one of the one of the aspects of Lego is that it's a great general purpose toolkit and we, we kind of designed Unix the same way. It's very composable. And we see it as this elegant, awesome, ass kicking kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> the world sees us more like this, which is just a pile of Lego, man. We just, we're gonna take the Legos that we want and please try to make them all square and we'll put them together for these automation tasks and these sort of mobile and embedded uh, development things. Um, but of course, they're not all square because this is really more what it looks like. It's a lot of square pieces and some very specialized pieces that you can't do anything but one thing with. So what, what's, what's hitting us hard uh, in, our, in our insufficiently abstracted Lego universe is, again, the fact that we have a, we're carrying around a lot of weight to support physical hardware that really no longer exists in quantity. Uh, the most, most, I think I don't have any metrics to, to make up on the spot, but I would say that probably the majority of OS deployments today are virtual, uh, if you just counted sheer, sheer number of seats. Uh, and of course the devices attached to those are also virtual. So the quality of your virtual device drivers is probably more important or becoming more important than the ones for your physical device drivers. Now, there are exceptions, of course. A 10 base, you know, or a, um, a 10 gigabit uh, NICs and whatnot, or 40 gigabit, or soon 100 gigabit, they have very specific demands that they place on physical hardware. So at some point, you have to run your, your copy of ESXi or, or Zen Center or whatever on some physical hardware. That has to work. But everything from there on up is virtualized. And again, to talk about the, the two guys uh, with two laptops in the San Francisco coffee shop scenario, I'll, most of what their automation tools actually do is do their best to erase the notion of a host personality. They're to take all the configuration information and take it from some other place and splat it on top of a running OS instance. So a lot of the, the beautiful abstractions that we've built for, for configuring and for sort of personalizing a box or even the, the workflow that we're used to where we get a copy of FreeBSD on a CD-ROM or a thumb drive if we're a little bit more progressive and we install it on a physical machine and we go through all the configuration steps and lovingly tailor it to our needs, that's dead. It really is. I mean, we do it because we're used to it. It's really, really familiar to it. I mean, we kept using SysInstall for how long? So, um, but that's not how the rest of the world wants to do it. They want to do it in an automated fashion. They want to script it. So getting back to mobile, uh, again, I feel very comfortable in saying that the number of Unix machines running on a battery are now several orders of magnitude above those running off of AC. And they're not plugged. I mean, I'm physically plugged into a few things because I have to be, but again, you're talking to radios now. You're talking to Bluetooth, you're talking to Wi-Fi, you're talking to near field communications devices. You're, it is a radio, it's an RFI world. And that creates some interesting uh, design uh, pressures on you. Obviously, power consumption becomes absolutely key. If your watch or your phone goes dead after just 24 hours of use, you consider that a very unusable device, or at least you're, you're pretty pissed off that you have to go plug that thing in every night or it's dead the next morning. And because radios tend to, to make very um, uh, sporadically, uh, what's, what's the word I'm trying to find here, the quality is variable in a radio signal. And the things like interference and whatnot become uh, real problems, things like channel congestion. So all of these things put back pressure 
on the operating system to do things like become uh, more agile and hop around or, or change the, the radio's configuration to, to dynamically seek out the best possible connection opportunities. And obviously, if you're a truly mobile device, you might be doing 100 miles an hour down the Autobahn and continuously disconnecting and reconnecting to different uh, cell towers. So that, that puts some, some really interesting uh, constraints on the OS. So one of the, the less obvious points to make is that trying to debug this and actually diagnose problems in the field also put some, some real challenges on you. And our telemetry sucks. Our ability to do remote debugging sucks. I'm not gonna, not gonna mince words. Uh, we have some work to do there. Because again, if you're trying to make a genuinely mobile device, you need those things. You, you will live and die on the strength of those technologies. So I wanted to point out something else that was interesting. Because if we look at our open source brethren, uh, one of the biggest desktop providers in the Linux space that I think we, we can point to now is Ubuntu. They're, they're a huge success story. Mark Shuttleworth opened his pocketbook and you know, basically wrote them a lot of blank checks. And they were able to do pretty much anything they wanted. And if you look at their, the evolution of their website over the last year, they used to be a desktop OS. And now if you look very carefully, you see cloud, server, desktop, phone, tablet, TV, management, and all of the large panels down there are about how they're ready for smartphones and they're number one for cloud. They, they, are, they are not skating to where the puck is going, but they're chasing it. They saw the puck go by and they went, whoa, what happened? That way. And we have to do the same. So what that means in technical terms is we need to be, to, really open to fundamentally new approaches. One of the, really one of the, the, the best things that I got to do when I went to Apple in 2001 was get given essentially a blank check on the engineering side. I was told, look, we already pissed off our installed base of, of Mac OS 9 users. There's really nothing more you can do to them that hasn't already been done. You're, you're starting fresh with OS 10 and do whatever has to be done to make it the, the, the best OS for the kinds of products that we want to make. And we, I took them up on that. We all collectively took them up on that. And we, we, we went, I won't say we went nuts. That, that, would, be, that would be too, too strong a word. But, but we took full advantage of it. We, we ripped Cron out. We ripped INET-D out. We ripped uh, a bunch of other weird legacy services for mock out. And we consolidated it all with LaunchD. We wrote all kinds of different mechanisms for dealing with dynamic uh, device uh, arrival and removal and power management, and we just, we just went to town. And we knew that we were going to be able to abstract all the system administration issues through, away through the GUI or later with iOS with almost no UI at all, uh, at least not for system administration. And so we were able to fundamentally re-architect big, big chunks of the system. And that was actually a wonderful thing because for the first few years, we dealt with all the same reactions that you would expect in a classic Unix environment. You did what? You changed what? You, you can have my INET-D when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers, right? We had all the same reactions. It wasn't like everybody was just like, oh, sure. But a couple of years down the line, when everyone saw, gee, you know, I can just launch this by dropping this file into this directory, and I can specify in a very flexible fashion how to scrub the environment and how to launch it in a secure fashion. I don't have to worry about people prepending stuff to my command line. You know, there were a bunch of, of security ramifications and just ease of use ramifications that came along with the rearchitecture that in a couple of years, it was like, of course you do it that way. Why wouldn't you? So, Again, that's really hard in open source. You know, we have the, the famous bike shed effect that we like to talk about in FreeBSD where you know, any proposal that, that, that threatens to change the status quo gets bike shedded to death. And I, I think that's really not as charming as it used to be. I think that needs to change. Because to, to do all the things that I'm pointing at and to move into these markets means some things have got to change. We've got to, we've got to fundamentally re-architect some things. Uh, we also need to be willing to, to shamelessly, I mean, uh, adopt and, and learn from things that, are, that other people are doing. I mean, we don't have to do this all ourselves. There are a lot of technologies out there that have been practically offered on a plate to the FreeBSD community in the past, and they've kind of said, 
eh, it's not really our flavor. We didn't, we didn't architect that ourselves. Yeah, we'll think about it. And then years go past and, and opportunities are missed. So I think we need to be a lot less proud about that because again, we are a commodity OS now. There's not a lot of point in being truly unique and niche anymore. Um, and the, the, the last thing is I think we need to be willing to take on some big picture challenges. Um, back, back in the 90s when I first started doing this, I used to you know, stand up in stages like this and talk about finding a mountain. And, and my big analogy was, you know, when you're going on a mountain climbing expedition, it has a wonderfully focusing effect on everybody involved. You gotta pack for it, you gotta get all the right supplies, and now it's kind of dangerous, and you're climbing up a peak, and it's hard, but it's also incredibly rewarding, and you're doing something that you've never tried to do before, at least if it's the first time you climb that mountain. And uh, it, it brings you all on the same page, right? You're gonna climb that mountain and try not to die. And I think, I think we, we may have lost sight of that a little bit. I think we need to find some more mountains to climb. We need to pick some big picture challenges that will be hard. Because, you know, when I, I first uh, got involved with this, I was, I was 30 years old and 30 pounds lighter, and I'm, I'm getting old. And a lot of us in this room are getting old, and we need to find something, we need to find challenges that will appeal to the next generation of, of hackers. Uh, and that's something we actually did pretty well in, in the, the 90s and the first part of this millennium. Uh, it it's shocks me sometimes to realize that some of the movers and shakers in this project, the, the leaders, the, the grand old men, were just starting college when they first came to FreeBSD. They were the young, snotty-nosed kids, right? And uh, now they're not. They, 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 have, they have become the new generation and, and the, the leaders. Well, that's gonna happen again. Again, if we're trying to get 10, 20 years further down the line, we have to think about that now. And thank God for the Google Summer of Code, by the way, because I think without it, we wouldn't even know what interns were. So again, I wanna get specific. I don't wanna just keep waving my hands up here, but one uh, obvious project idea that we need to take on is to, to automate a machine, to, to really run it through all of its paces, cradle to grave, you need to be able to munge its configuration data. And slash Etsy is a septic tank. It is just a whole bunch of weird ass formats and things that have been there forever and ever and ever. It's really, really time to just toss that out. That's one of these re-architecture goals I'm talking about. Um, and I don't care about the format. It can be YAML, it can be JSON, it can be XML, uh, but there should be a single way of, of uh, accessing it, reading it, writing it, finding it, and you know, it's really kind of sad that even in this day and age, in the year 2014, if I write a new utility that's gonna be a new daemon that runs on my system and I need to have a configuration file format for it, there is no API. I need to write my own bison parser and invent something in, and put it in slash Etsy because why not everything else is there. That's, and let's not even talk about the dot files in your home directory, right? This is this just architecturally, eh. yes. Um, and obviously we need to have the, the cojones to go back and alter all the existing tools to use it. That's the thing that everybody always stops at. Well, yeah, but if I come up with the library and I come up with the single unified format, then I gotta go change these things. Change them. It's, it's more trouble to talk about it than it is to just to do it. It really is. I, I've been there, done that. It's not as hard as it looks. Oop. And just to point that out, that it's not as hard as it looks, to use this little machine here as an example, everything in OS X, whether it's system configuration data, per app configuration data, per service configuration data, it's all an XML plist in a couple of known locations. And that's it. And we, went, we hacked the utilities. We did everything required to, to unify on that. Is it the best format that ever walked the earth? No. Is it good enough? Yes. What's that? No, you just look at uh, Core Foundation Lite and you can, again, t steal the ideas. You don't have to take the implementation. Just, I mean, th there, there's not a lot to it. There really isn't. And there, there are probably 50 XML parsers. Uh, it's, you know, you don't have to write this yourself. So another thing that needs to be done, especially if you want to work in the mobile space, is you need a, notifi a centralized notification system. You need to be able to register for notifications and you need to be able to post notifications. Right now, on your average FreeBSD-based appliance, if I even just change my host name, a bunch of stuff stops working. That's really silly. 
It's one of the first notifications that OS X added was com.system.hostname. You subscribe to that, anybody changes it from any place, boom, you know it's changed. Go do whatever you have to do to your internal state, adapt, move on. Obviously, radio is powering up and down at all times, like I talked about, network configuration changing because you're moving between cells, uh, your IP address is changing, uh, Chef or Puppet has gone and whacked a new set of configuration data onto you entirely, and everybody now needs to go and, you, you know, the world has fundamentally changed. And right now that is done so crudely, it's just you run around, hit everything with a hammer that you think might have been affected and restart it, and there's just no technology there. It's just brute force. Uh, and it doesn't need to be. It really doesn't. What you also see as a result of not having a distributed notification system is there's a bunch of things like Active Directory libraries and whatnot that cache information. And since they have no way to do caching validation, you know, they break the first rule of computer science, never cache anything you don't know how to invalidate. Well, what they do instead is they run a cron job once every hour or whatever to shoot the cache in the head. So they do a bunch of work, wasting a bunch of power, and, you know, and possibly doing needless network traffic to, to recreate a cache that didn't need to be recreated, or during that one hour period when that user got added over there, and now people are going, I can't chone, something's wrong. Well, that cache is still screwing you up. So we, you really, we really need it. And again, because I want to talk about real examples, here's the Notify API. Notify API was done probably in all of two weeks. And a simple Notify daemon, if you have an OS X box, you can send it to SIG user one, and it will dump all the subscribers uh, into var run Notify in the name of the PID status. And you'll see there's just a huge number of notifications. And when we first did this, we probably had five, six. In fact, I think we first did it to deal with time zone changes because we found out there was code in libc that was statting Etsy local time thousands of times a second. Why? Well, because the time zone might have changed. So it's one of the first things we did is make that a notification. And you'll see, if you can read the slide, that some of those, well, it's too slid over too far, but some of them are you know, direct point-to-point -point notifications. Some of them are using a little shared memory cell so that if you want to poll, uh, periodically just to see if your cache is invalid or you can do it that way. It'll, it'll send you a signal, it'll do any number of things. It's open source. So again, either use the implementation or just use the ideas. So as I keep mentioning, uh, the whole system startup and service wrangling stuff is, um, there, there's an old saying, you, you, you can't polish a turd but you can paint it. And etcrc.d is a painted etcrc. So, you know, I, I was one of the architects of this stuff. I, I think I probably checked in the first copy of rc.local, uh, rc.conf, actually, because, uh, hey, let's add some knobs. What, 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 what harm can that do? Uh, and it's, it's evolved. It's incredibly sophisticated. I've actually looked at the etcrc.d code and seen all the little provides and, you know, require stuff in there and then seeing how it builds a directed acyclic graph and runs all the things in the right order, and it's like, wow, this is kind of a, a triumph of, of uh, brute force over adversity. But it's also wrong. Right? It's just not how you want to do it. You want to do things dynamically. You want to essentially just register and say, hey, when something tries to talk to me, start me up. And I don't want to make any dependencies explicit anywhere. Because the problem with explicit dependencies is they keep changing. And you keep having to chase uh, that dragon. And anyone adding a new service doesn't even necessarily know which, what they depend on. They find that out by trial and error. So again, um, you know, I'm, I'll talk about that in a second, but you know, I'm not going uh, to suggest LaunchD because I've, I've beaten that drum enough times. But even the Linux diehards have gone with systemd. They've refactored their system. Um, and it's, you know, again, just having a broker that you can register with and uh, you know, on demand with IPC or timed events or hardware arrival removal will do the right thing using some metadata to tell it what the service needs to do and what it needs to run is really the right architecture. And to that last slide, if you really want to do power management, you also fundamentally need this because you can't let things run too long. You, you, do need, you, do need, you do need an adult in the room, right? Something that says, you have been running for too long and I can see your prior consumption going up. You've run away. And you know, people write crappy code. 
it's a fact of life. And you're not always going to be able to even control what crappy code gets installed on the system because there are these app writers who write these apps and they stick them on there and they run them in the background or they run them from cron or whatever. And when one of those things runs amok on your mobile device, all you know is that the mobile device, which should have had a battery life of five or six days, had a battery life of two hours. And now you're pissed off. And you blame the device. You blame the crappy operating system on that device. You don't blame the errant app because you don't even know that it, it was errant. Where, where do you get that information from? What, what telemetry tells you that it was errant? So you need to shoot it down. And, or you need to at least have something that's in charge to report on it. Say, hey, this guy is acting weird. You should probably do something about that. So again, I keep coming back to this. Um, but yeah, we need, we need telemetry. And, and speaking with my FreeNAS hat on, we're going to do it at IX Systems. We're going to create a telemetry, a daemon, and some APIs for it. And we're going to pretty much instrument the crap out of everything. Because we, we are at the pointy end of the spear in terms of dealing with enterprise customers who have file servers, which are one of the most critical pieces of infrastructure for people. And when those things go, go hinky, they rely on us to figure out why. And far too often, we have no idea. We, we, come, we come to the scene of the accident an hour or two after it's already occurred, and all we do is see bodies lying all over the road. And we don't even have things to measure the skid marks with, because there are no skid marks, right? These are virtual bodies, and it's a virtual accident. And so we need, to, we need better than syslog. We need some way to say, all right, let's look at your telemetry. What, what was going on? Uh, in the hour prior to this event. Uh, and maybe even what was going on from a couple of different data collection points. Because guess what? People break their networks. People have clients that go completely insane at 3 o'clock in the morning, usually on Saturday night, and start flooding you know, the, the server with, with, with NFS requests or, or just otherwise acting bizarre. And you can't even always detect that from the server. All you know is you get a lot of traffic. Was that good? Was that bad? I, you know, I don't know. Um, so. Usually when you talk about telemetry and remote debugging, a certain three-letter agency gets mentioned and everybody starts throwing things. Uh, let me tell you something. The NSA does not need our help. They do their data collection much further upstream where it's already pre-aggregated for them. They do not need to attack the individual boxes. That would be a waste of their time. But the, the users do need the telemetry. Because again, to keep returning to this point, maybe harping on it a little, we're running in a lot of appliances now. And those appliances, the users just want them to work. And the, you, you've probably used 100 products just in the last year where there's a little question, do you want to help make this product better? And unless you're really paranoid, you probably said, sure. Guess what that meant? You signed up for telemetry. So finally, on the debugging comment, which I think should be totally uncontroversial, we do need a way of doing IP debugging. And that's another thing that iXSystems is going to sponsor. We have a, a rough prototype already working. But I'll tell you, I could never have worked on this or the phone without some way of debugging it remotely. It was just, it, just insane trying to do anything else. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to always have a serial port or, or uh, a serial over IP or you know, any of those sort of kludgy ways of, of getting at debugging. And of course, sadly, Firewire is, is going the way of the Dodo 2. And that was really cool because you could do Firewire DMA. But it's leaving, so we need to be able to deal with panicked boxes in the field over IP. And that means basically a very simple IP stack that, that, gets, uh, that gets used in the, in the times of last resort and says, all right, debug me now. Uh, and guess what? When you have that feature, you can also start doing other interesting things, which I've used as well, which is little web portal things that do nothing but say, give me an IP address, and I will go connect for you and I will scrape that box and I'll run a bunch of GDB scripts on it and I'll grab all the relevant information and I'll file a ticket and I'll attach this stuff to it and I'll even tell the triage team, hey, it's still there at the, at the debugger prompt if you want to connect and, and do different things. Uh, and if you don't, well, I, I got you everything that most people need to, to debug a kernel panic. So um, also being able to NMI a box when it's stuck or hung or really, really slow or you know, there's some weird lock contention problem going on, it, it can make the difference between finding a really pernicious problem that's been annoying people for years and, and not. So one other thing I've raved about on the, the project mail list a little bit is I think, I think the SBCs, the Raspberry Pis, the BeagleBones, all of that as porting platforms have been really valuable. 
I don't want to even sound like I'm disparaging them. I think they're really cool, they're really cheap, uh, they're really useful, and we should keep porting to them. But I think, I think we've reached the level of stability and usefulness with the ARM port that it's time to actually move to real stuff, to, to, to a reference phone, to a reference tablet. And I'm not even sure what that reference phone or tablet is yet. There's a plethora of them right now. If you go to Singapore or Hong Kong, you can go to a market and buy uh, five tablets for, for 100 bucks. I mean, you know, they're, they're really generic now. And they usually run some weird concocted version of Android or something. But they are getting cheap enough now that at some point we're going to be able to kind of look at the the horrible, the not so bad, and the, the great, and then pick something in the middle, because the great are probably going to be expensive, and say, that's going to be our first re reference platform for a phone port, or for a tablet port. And, and the, the main reason for that is, is, is multifold. There, there are multiple reasons for this. One is, as I point out here, you're never going to know how to deal with real radios, real devices like accelerometers, cameras, et cetera, and so forth, until you actually run on a platform that has those things. Um, and you want to be able to support those things because they're part of what make a phone or a tablet an interesting device to use. Also being able to carry around a copy of you know, FreeBSD running on one of these reference things means we'll be able to actually validate that our telemetry and our debugging stuff works. Uh, because if you don't use it, you don't live on it, so to speak, then you're, you're not validating that, that, that an end user in that same role is going to have a good experience. Um, and finally, again, using those sort of things will, will require that we think of a little higher up. We're not just a kernel. We, we are a collection of services and utilities, and at some point we'll have something for dealing with Bluetooth and dealing with audio and dealing with displays, and all those things are going to have to be part of the software stack. And I think it's time that we, we tackle some of those things, because again, those are the interesting challenges. It's, it's, FreeBSD should be more than just hacking on kernels. So. To sum it all up, um, I think we still have some rough edges in, in not being sufficiently Lego-like. Again, uh, OS is a commodity now. It's, it's been out for decades and decades, so we should make it more usable for the people who want to automate it, virtualize it, stick it in a cable, uh, and, and not uh, have anything that stands in the way of doing that, or, or essentially force them to do the subtractive exercise of pulling stuff out. It's, it's uh, one of the first things that people do is, is have, to, have to yank code out of FreeBSD, and that's kind of silly. Uh, we, we should make it possible just to conditionally compile it in the first place. Uh, and again, just to reinforce my previous point, we need to pick hardware platforms that are, that are real and relevant. Phones, tablets, watches, cables. Let's, let's find some reference ones and, and actually start porting to those and see how it works. And, uh, and because we're going to be kind of late to the party, we should be willing to look over the fence to people who've already done all this. The Androids and the Apples of the world have already been down this path and they've done a lot of cool technology, some of which is open source, some of which you can just look at a header file and say, all right, come and see kind of what they did in this design, or, or just watch it work. And you can learn a lot from that and, and clone it. You don't have to necessarily take the same code. You can, you can create your own independent, independent implementation, but, but skipping a lot of the hard work and figuring out what it should look like. So, uh, and let me just say that we do have a bit of a rep in being resistant to this kind of thing. That, you know, if you go to the BSD folks, oh, they'll bike shed you to death. They're not going to take your ideas on board. They're not interested. That, that's a really unfortunate reputation. And I don't think it's entirely merited, but to the degree that it is, we should shake it off and, and change that reputation. So, in summary, the future is ours if we want it. Thank you.